hard game coming up. I mean, it's a team that's won over 30 games two years in a row. And um, uh, Kelvin is one of the guys that I, I, uh, I've gotten to know him over the years. Uh, I remember 1990, ooh, mid-90s sometime, uh, sitting at home, watching television, 11.30 at night, Pac-12 game, watching Washington State play, I think it was Arizona. And I didn't know Washington even existed as a state back then. And that's, you know, you're in South Florida, you don't realize that there's a rest of the country. And, uh, and I remember watching this team play and said, wow, holy cow, I love how they play. And started following them from that day forward. Uh, I've gotten to know them over the years through Coach Huggins and Perry Clark and him are very good friends. And um, I got so much respect for how his teams play. And, and um, uh, so we got our hands full. It's going to be by far the most physical game we've played uh, this year um, as far as the way they play and how consistent they are with their physicality. And they got real good players. Frank, you mentioned that the past two years they've been an elite team, I think Sweet 16 last year, but I think they lost like six guys. What have you seen from them? Have they changed anything in his usual style to accommodate all of their newcomers? They had two guys red shirting. They had a transfer McDonald All-American that played at Kansas last year, so he played at a high level for a high level team uh, that got declared eligible to play right away. Uh, he was prepared uh, to absorb uh, the departing seniors. Now, they're a little different. They had two guys. I think one made 120 threes and the other one made 113 threes. Uh, the two, two of their guards last year, they were unbelievable shooters. Um, you know, it's, uh, they're not shooting the three the way they did last year at the same clip. They still shoot them and they take good shots. They don't turn it over and they take good shots. That's why they're such a good offensive rebounding team. Um, with our luck, they're going to make every three. I mean, I, I, we, we, you know, it's, uh, we, we play teams, and there's guys that, that are one for the last nine years come in, and they start making off the dribble threes against us. And um, so we're prepared uh, to, to deal with them making threes. That's how we're going to guard them, because they shoot them, uh, and they got good players. But, but they were prepared with what they had in stock, and then obviously getting Grimes in and eligible right away. Uh, to absorb those uh, those graduations. Frank, the, the caliber of opponent are, are a little bit different this year as opposed to last year. But you had a few early losses last year, a few early losses this year. How do you see your team handling those differently this year as opposed to last year? Yeah, I mean, you know, John, I, I don't know. Uh, I think Northern Iowa is is. I think they're really good, and. I mean, you were there. You you sat and, you know, we fought. We had a chance to win that game, and I was disappointed we didn't. Um, uh, Wichita, I think, is real good. Uh, I think Wichita is a real good team. And, um, you know, they they got us. I mean, it just it is what it is. You step in the ring, sometimes you get hit in the wrong place, you go down. I mean, it's, it's just it is what it is. Um, uh, we're better prepared this year to absorb um, a setback uh, because we have enough bodies. Uh, last year, because of injuries and youth, uh, sometimes here, here's the biggest problem. When, when, when you have a setback, sometimes when you're dealing with young kids, young players, sometimes they pout. You hear coaches all the time say, don't let one loss become two. You, that rarely happens when you got upperclassmen because they've been through it, they understand. Uh, last year, we had some of that, and I had limited bodies. So whoever pouted, I had to figure out a way to get them back into the right mindset, but still go play at Michigan and at whatever, um, or you know Virginia at home, whatever it may be. And, and it's hard to win when your spirits are down. We have enough bodies right now where if player A is not on his P's and Q's, player B steps in. And, and uh, uh, there's not a lot of uh, drop-off from one guy to the next guy. They're all kind of – that's what I'm still trying to figure out 
is how to play certain guys because we, we've got a lot of um, equally talented players, different skill sets, but equally talented players, and um, uh, which makes it difficult for a coach. But that's a difficulty that I welcome. It's the difficulties the other way around when you're not good enough and uh, you don't have enough um, that, that makes it challenging. Uh, last year's team uh, was forced to – What's the word? Not regroup, but kind of take a deep breath and say, hey, we, we got to do things a whole lot better or we're not going to win. And uh, this year's team has not been forced to do that because there's enough guys that if one guy kind of drops his head for a second, someone else is ready to go. And so, uh, but we're, what, I don't even know what our record is, six and three? So we're nine games in, a third of the way through the season. There's still so many games to play that, that uh, there's, there's a whole lot of stuff that can change between now and, and heck, Christmas, let alone the end of the season. Yeah, along those same lines, it seems like you guys figured it out at the start of SEC play last year with that Florida game and then going forward. Is this an opportunity, now that you're at full strength, now that Keyshawn's back ahead of these big three non-conference games um, and then Stetson, obviously, not, is, this, is this a, a test not only, or uh, an opportunity for you guys to, to get these big wins, but also to see what you guys look like <laughs> at full strength heading into SEC play, we can really ramp it up. Yeah, I mean, here's, here's the thing. Last year, uh, I don't mean to disagree with you, the Florida game is what gave us the confidence that we can win those games. We started to figure it out in that hotel room in Wyoming after that embarrassing performance. And, and we went in and played at Michigan and played our tails off. Couldn't win. But we started to believe, like, okay, if we do certain things and we're aggressive, we got a chance. And we came home and we lose Mike to a concussion. And we played Virginia. I think everyone understands how good they were last year. And we're in a six, seven-point game in the second half. And we're fighting our tails. Couldn't score, but we're fighting our tails off. And even though they end up getting us, we continued to develop a little uh, bit of confidence. And we played Clemson, and we didn't play as well as against Clemson. Uh, but still, we kind of hung around there. And, um, and I'm telling you, that first practice after that Christmas, guys went home for Christmas, I was blown away at how well and how excited guys. Usually that first practice when they come back from Christmas, they're like, man, I've been sitting on the couch and my mom cooked for me and I'm here on campus and there's no one around. And that's kind of the, the – so you got to get that out of them that nonsense out of them. Those guys were like flying last year. I was like, blew me away. Um, and then we played that, uh, I don't remember who we played, non-division one uh, over the holidays. And we really played well and played with confidence. And then beating Florida kind of made us say, you know what, we can do this. And, and then we took off from there. But um, um, I'm just telling you, Gardner Webb is really good. GW is a lot better than what everyone perceived them to be in the pre. That's why these preseason stuff, you can't pay attention to that stuff. GW, I'm not going to sit here and tell you they're world beaters. They're a pretty good team. Uh, Northern Iowa was the real deal. I, I tried to tell everyone here when, when uh, Wofford got us last year that they're really good. Northern Iowa is really good. Um, now Wichita is really good. Wichita has a sweet 16 makeup as a team. Now, are they going to be able to make enough shots and, and you know, because they're a little young, even though uh, they, all their guys are back from last year. I, I don't know, but they got the depth, they got the size, they got the athletic ability. They're good. Uh, we've played some quality teams, so we should not be in culture shock going into this next, what is it? I'm probably going to get this wrong. Houston, Clemson, Virginia, is that correct? We shouldn't be in culture shock into these three games. UMass, UMass has played. UMass was undefeated at home. UMass, um, you know, was up six with six minutes to play against St. John's on a neutral court, and somehow they ended up losing by 14. But they were up six with six to play. Uh, they 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 were neck and neck with Virginia late in the second half. Um, you know, we, we went in and beat a team on their home court where they had not lost. Uh, so uh, that doesn't mean we're going to win the next three games, but I think we're prepared um, 
for what's coming in front of us. But all three are going to be hard, and two of those on the road. Um, um, but, but yes, my typical 45-minute answer to your simple question, <laughs> these games will prepare us for the SEC. That's why we put them on the schedule. Frank, outside of points, blocks, leadership, what does having a healthy Keyshawn back do for this team? Uh, last year, Keyshawn was an athlete that had basketball instincts. He didn't understand how to play um, as a guard or, you know, he just he was trying to figure it out. He worked a lot in the offseason on understanding how to – be a better basketball player, improving his skill set, understanding the game, uh, worked his tail off in all our individual instructions, had a great pre not a good, a great preseason. Uh, he brings a personality to our team. Our guards, if, if, if there's one thing that bothers me with our guards right now, and, and for the most part with this team, is that when the game starts, we get very quiet. And other than Jermaine and Mike, everyone else gets really quiet and kind of they they uh, they kind of get in their in their own, especially our young guards. They get in their own feelings. Um, Keyshawn don't get in his feelings. Keyshawn brings a personality uh, that we we really really need. Um, but he made like he made a play that three point play where he drives the lane uh, in a crucial part of the game. That's something that I've been begging everyone on our team to do anytime we're running that kind of what we were running there. Um, you know, he kind of saw what was going on on that side of the floor and realized the defense was out of the paint, and he said, I'm gone. And, uh, um, you know, he gives us that. He's the best dribble driver of the basketball on our basketball team uh, against set defense. There's a lot of guys that drive it in the open court. He's he's the best on our team against set defense. and. Uh, I can tell you what, he, he didn't do well last year. And he did pretty good in preseason, but he was not good at his rebounding the ball the other day at UMass. He's got to be a better rebounder for us. But he, he blocked shots. Uh, he created a steal in a difficult – they tried to isolate him, and, and he knocked the ball loose and created a steal for us right when we were making our run there. Um, uh, he, he's, he's got a knack for making plays. And uh, – uh, you know, having him back uh, gives us – other than him and A.J., there's not another guard on our team that's ever played a – well, T.J. played three or four games. Justin played as a freshman. But they're, they're both coming off, like, not sprained ankles, like real injuries. Um, they're the only two guys on our team that, that, that are like guards, that are playmakers with the basketball, that have really, really played a season for us and understand what we want. And, you know, and uh, – so it's uh, having them back uh, gives us all those things. Frank, I, I know you get tired of answering this question, but with regard to free throw shooting, is there oh. anything you can do as a head coach, or is it just the oh. players taking a little bit more pride in, in what they need to do? Oh. I had some guy, uh, uh, I have no idea how I read it, because I don't read like – if I go on social media, I don't read at this time of year, the, what do you call it, the stuff that's sent di directed at me, whatever that page is. Messages. No, not direct messages. messages. That, I don't read that. But I'll go read whatever, you know, players are doing, recruits are doing, sometimes what the media is reporting because, you know, someone reports at 1 o'clock in the morning, hey, uh, news about something, you know, I have like, okay, there's something going on, I need to find out. So, um I have no idea how I jumped up, but some guy sent me a note on there uh, saying something about, hey, I asked you a question years ago uh, about free throw shooting at some Gamecock club function, and you looked at me, wanted to rip my head off. You know, it's that moment where you're sitting there and you're like, should I reply to this guy that maybe Chris Silva came in as a 50% free throw shooter and left almost at 80%? You know, should I just maybe say, oh, maybe you want to give us credit for that. Maybe you want to give us credit for the fact that Darius made 20-something free throws in one game. 
uh, or you're always going to pick on like the year that we got a couple guys missing free throws to to like ask me if we practice free throws. It, John, I, I've told our team, I'm not big. I, I think if you, if, if somebody, if I'm, I'm a big believer in this. You have to identify weaknesses, but you can't harp on them. If you harp on them, then people start getting worried. Then when they go to the foul line, they're worried about, man, even Frank thinks I'm going to miss. I don't harp on that stuff, but I have talked to our team about, like, oh, we, we got to make free throws, man. We got to make free throws. It's going to cost us in a difficult moment. Um, and, um, it cost us at Northern Iowa. It cost us that game. I mean, granted, we didn't shoot a lot of them, but I think we're five of 11 from the foul line. I, you know, if we're eight of 11, we probably win that game. And um, it's, uh, we practice them. I mean, we, we, we do it like game-like situations in practice. Uh, uh, all I can tell you is this, the guys that make free throws on our team, make them consistently. And the guys that aren't, are not making them consistently in practice either. And we, all we can do is keep keep teaching. And I, I get the fact that everyone thinks that, that, you know, oh, Frank's just this loud, obnoxious, you know, foot stomping, whatever. You don't teach people through fear or negativity. You teach them by teaching, by trying to help them with what they're doing. And we, we spend a lot of time with those guys uh, trying to get them to, to, to have clean technique, clean mind, so they can believe the ball's going in. You know, TJ missed two free throws. I can put TJ in practice. He'll make 10 in a row, like in real practice, not just stand at the line. Like, here's a great part about that, John, is everyone that always says, well, I can make 10 free throws. Yeah, when you're standing in a gym at the YMCA and you're not guarding anybody and it's just some guy rebounding for you. I, me, two bad knees, bad right shoulder, I'll probably make 10 in a row. Now, when you got to go guard, and you're getting ball screened, and you're getting hit in the back of the head 27 times, and you're going 100 miles per hour, and then you drive the ball, and you get put on your head. If you remember the play, TJ got hit pretty good, landed. Now you got to get up and go make free throws. Good luck making 10 in a row there. They're, they're few and far between the guys that can make 10 in a row in those, those situations. But he can't miss them both. And, uh, um, and they were both right there. They just didn't go in. I, I got mad at him because after he missed the second one, he pouted. And he gives up a layup on the other end. Um, you know, it's – it's. Uh, I wish I had an answer for you. Patience, patience. You know, Chris was a freshman. He shot 50. That's 50 – not 50 free throws, 50%. And he left here being a pretty darn good free throw shooter. Um, uh, I'd, I'd rather – Go the other way. The guy just spoke to you guys. He has struggled from the line in his career here. He went to the line the other day with the game on the line, made his first one in a one-on-one. -on -one. You know, in the past, he would have missed and then dejected and made this one. The second one just missed. But um, we, we just – I just hope it doesn't cost us games. We, we got to teach, teach, teach. And at the end of the day, coaches get blamed too much for missed free throws. Believe me, we practice it. Uh, I wish they give coaches credit for A.J. making two at the end of the game. I, uh, you know, uh, Brenton Williams, I think, led the country in free throw percentage. No one ever gave. That kid never played before I got here. No one ever said, God, dog, Frank's assistants must really be doing a great job teaching these guys how to shoot free throws. It's, uh, um, I, I, I wish I had an answer for you. I really do. PJ, his freshman year, did not want to go to the foul line. Just avoided it. He didn't want to be in that moment. Uh, and I'm not talking about the end of the game. I'm the second play of the game. He just did not want to be at the foul line. Sophomore year got a little better. Now he's in a good place. Um, it's uh, it's got to be patient there. Andrew a little off the beaten path here, but you walk out, out of your office and you see the, the mannequin there with the Alex English uh, throwback jersey on, which you'll wear on, on Sunday. What has been your relationship with, with Alex uh, since the time you got here? And, um, how important is it for you to have him still around this, this program? Yeah, I, I remember the first time I walked out and I saw that there. I asked Andy Ashley, I said, are we uh, a side business for Dick Sporting Goods now? I mean, you know, we got mannequins with uniforms in the office. I'd never seen that one before. But uh, uh, then I realized it was his jersey. And I said, you know what, great idea. I, one, of, one of the most incredible things for me 
in my coaching career is the two places I've been at as a head coach is the people that have made it uh, part of their life to come in and watch us practice. Forget the games, practice. Uh, Tex Winter used to come in at K-State, and he had had a stroke, so his speech was impaired. And I was running practice, and I look over there, I'm Tex Winter watching me run basketball practice. And after practice, he'd want to share ideas, and, and that was incredible. And then I get here, and now I've got Alex English, one of my favorite players of all time. I, used to, I tell players in high school, I said, that guy would get 40 and not even break a sweat on you. And, and now he's there at practice every day. Um, and you're talking about a great basketball mind, a guy that played it at the, uh, the highest, highest level of players. I mean, he's probably the greatest player that's the least talked about, at least in my lifetime. Um, uh, and then coached it and, and has seen everything and, and been around incredible coaching. And, um, and, and he comes in and watches practice. Our staff just migrates to him. And, and, and listening him share the knowledge uh, that, of little things that, that he has seen or taught that can maybe help us tweak some of the things that we do. It, uh, I, I'm not that egomaniac that runs around thinking that I've got every answer. On the contrary, I'm constantly looking for answers. And when you can have him as a resource, uh, as much as he cares for this university and this basketball program, means a lot. And, and what gives me saving grace sometimes when I'm, um, when I'm sitting in those hotel rooms and we haven't played well, we lose a game, whether it's Cancun or wherever it is moving forward here this year, a lot of times what, what gives me a peace of mind to come in and do my job the next day, obviously my feelings are always in our players, is when I walk into gym and I see Alex sitting there to watch us practice. If he didn't think what we were doing worked, do you think he'd come in and watch practice? Same thing with Eddie Fogler. I mean, those guys come in and sit there to watch us practice. Um, that reinforces to me that people that I respect in the game of basketball appreciate how our players work and what they're being taught. And, and, uh, and, and you know, you're talking about a guy who wore that uniform as well as anyone in, in the history of our school and another guy that gave us our only SEC championship. And, and two guys that still live in this community that, that care for this program deeply, and they're basketball purists. And uh, so it's, it's awesome to have guys like that, like Alex, around uh, that care so much for what we do. Frank, um, you know, you, you speak of, of coaching free throws and how it's not just about getting in the gym and extra shots. Can you guys pipe in crowd noise? Can you have guys standing behind the backboard waving? I mean, just to try to simulate as much of a real game as possible? Or just how much can you try to put them in those game situations instead of just getting up shots when, when, when they can? Yeah, I, I think – I don't think crowd noise impacts free throw shooting. I really don't. Uh, I think the people sit behind the basket and all that can be a distraction sometimes, especially uh, younger players because – the hardest thing to do when you're young is focus. And, and when you don't know how to focus, your eyes can deceive you. It's just like playing golf. Go to the range, there's no trees. Everything's wide open. So you hit the ball, and wow, that thing's perfect. Now you go out and get on the tee box, and there's a tree and a bunker and water, and you're sitting there, and your eyes are saying, holy cow. And you end up hitting it in one of the three junks instead of hitting it down the middle. And, and I think that's where the pros are so good. They don't see the bunker, the water, and the trees. They see the fairway where they're trying to hit the ball. And, and it's the same thing with free throw shooting. So younger players can, can allow their eyes to be deceive them and look at things other than the rim or whatever their target is. Um, I, there's some guys that are just cut for that moment. They're just cut. I mean, there are other guys that it's a different shot. I'm just telling you, people don't understand. I grew up playing on the parks. You know what you never did when you played at the park? Shoot free throws. Never. Now, you shot at the rim, and you dealt with contact, and if you call fouls, you got your rear end beat down. So you learn how to never give in. But no one ever said, hey, let's work on your free throw shooting. I, I, and none of the guys I grew up with. But we had a teammate who would never miss a free throw. And no one ever taught him. He kind of just that confidence, he was a good shooter, just that confidence that he believed he can make it. 
And um, I just believe that the way in practice, it's a little different. When you just go to the free throw line at the end of practice and you're trying to make 100 free throws, um, you know, it's, that's just for your mind and your technique. Uh, but I believe that you have to simulate game and practice and, and as that up and down, all of a sudden, bang, you go shoot free throws. And, and, uh, and guys have to respond to that moment. And like we'll be at practice sometimes and, our good, and we're doing that stuff and our good free throw shooters are the ones that keep going to the foul line. And I'm like, yo, yo, I'm tired of watching you make. Are we going to put some of the missers on the line to see if they can ever help us? And then they go to the line and sometimes they make, sometimes they don't. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, but it's, I don't think there's, other than helping them with technique and their mindset, I don't think there's anything you can do that's going to change that moment. A tougher thing for you to prepare for game Sunday or the Bojangles drive through on the 10th. And what would be your favorite Bojangles biscuit? You know, I worked at there. I have, I was trying to remember last time I worked a drive through at a, at a coffee shop in Manhattan, Kansas. And uh, uh, before, when I lived in South Florida, I worked, uh, I was a bus boy, I was a waiter, I was a bartender. So serving people, it's always been a lot of fun for me. Um, so I'm gonna enjoy that. I just hope Bojangles understands the way I roll. Cause when I worked at Dairy Queen, for every two cones I sold, I ate one. So it's, uh, I hope they understand that they got some damage coming their way. It's, it's going to be great. It's uh, just to, to get in there and, uh, you know, it, it, it be around, you know, people that, that for whatever reason, I, I still live in that place where I get in a room and I'm with somebody who's on television all the time and I'm awestruck. I'm like, holy cow, I can't believe I'm next to this person. And um, I love being around people. I love, you know, and, and serving. It, there's, there's not a, there's not a better profession than when you serve people food. As long as you give them good service, people love their food. That makes people feel good. Eating is what brings us together. And then when we can do that, and at the same time, uh, I think I don't want to misspeak here, Em. You might want to help me with this, but. I believe everyone that buys something while I'm the one serving the drive through window, uh, they're going to get a couple tickets for one of our games later on in the month. And, um, you know, so it's a great way to promote our program, uh, get around and get in there with, you know, folks that are hardworking people that, that serve others and, and then uh, maybe get some folks excited that never been to a game to come watch us play. And uh, maybe they like what they see and uh, they keep coming as we keep trying to build our fan base and our program.